I should have done it a lot earlier. So when I told you I was looking to a shampoo bottle as an accountability coach, that was probably not the <laughs> ideal way to do it. <laughs> real Estate Investing Profits presents Profit Masters with your host, world-renowned real estate coach and investor, Corey Boatwright. Now, strap in and get ready to learn elite wealth building investment strategies taught by six and seven figure house flipping masters as they reveal their best real estate investing profit secrets to you right now. What is going on, my potty people? Hey, this is Corey Boatwright. I am the founder of Real Estate Investing Profits and your host, Real Estate Investing Profit Masters. I hope you're having a phenomenal, fun, productive day. I am bringing you another interview that I know you're going to love, and it is from none other than Mr. Nick Alrude. Alrude, Alrude, Alrude. Dang it, Nick. I'm, I'm just going to butcher your name. Uh, but if you listen, you'll hear him pronounce it correctly because I asked him about it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he is someone that's really interesting uh, on his journey as an investor. I think you're going to learn a lot from what he shares with uh, his pain that he went through with some of his investing um, <laughs> downfalls and lessons that he's learned. I don't really think failure is uh, uh, a place you stay. I think a failure is a place you learn from, right? Amen? So we're going to listen to Nick, and he is going to share uh, his insights and journey on where he's been and where he's going today. So you are in for a amazing, an amazing, amazing treat. By the way, if you haven't downloaded the Ultimate Real Estate Investing Quick Start Guide, why haven't you? Shame on you, right? Go ahead. It's my gift. Go ahead to uh, text the word PROFIT to 38470. That's the word PROFIT the 38470, and it will auto-magically be sent to you. All right? Uh, also, if you're interested in real estate wholesale coaching, I am taking one. Now listen to this. This is uh, December of 2018. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, the, the November 29th of uh, 2018. At, at the end of the month here, right? I'm taking one more client for the month. One more client for the year, excuse me. One more client for the year. Uh, you are going to work with me directly, and it is uh, something that I promise you will uh, be very uh, grateful in the investment. So if you're interested in that, go to Corey's Coaching, C O R Y S. Coaching, Corey's coaching.com, and we can have a conversation after you answer a few of those questions. Sound good? I appreciate you so, so, so much. I hope you had a fantastic, phenomenal, and grateful Thanksgiving. And here you go, another Mr. Nick Allaru. Hey, Nick, are you there, my man? I'm here, Corey. How you doing, mother? Oh, uh, I am doing awesome. It's uh, a, a, a balmy 30 degrees here in the Boston area, and uh, just hanging out here with my sweatshirt and and my Patriots gear. In case I don't get this in, Patriots. Uh, can, you, can you put that up to the to the? <laughs> Love it. Those that are uh, listening right now, um, Nick. Uh, I know I'm going to butcher your name. Alarod. 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 You're good though. Alarod. Double A is fine. Close. Uh, it's close. What's your lineage, Nick? Lineage. I am a Norwegian and Swedish. Nice. I'm like nice. a Viking, but I can't grow a beard. I've been trying. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a small one, right? Well, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to be on here, Nick. And uh, I know you're going to uh, give us some good uh, tips and um, some strategies on what you're doing right now. Why don't you go ahead and we'll have this in the show notes, of course, but can you lead off here with uh, telling everybody uh, what your area investing in uh, real estate that you would consider as, as your expertise right now? Sure, absolutely. Uh, we're investors here in the, in the mainly Boston and Boston North markets. So North Massachusetts and Southern New Hampshire markets primarily. And we, um, that's our fix and flip, our wholesale. That's kind of our big presence. And we do have some, some buy and hold stuff in like Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio. That's kind of where we're, we're focused now. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you're doing right now fix and flips, wholesales, you're doing some buy and hold. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe you're going to start a property management company as well. That's uh, correct. Yeah. And, um, and then you also uh, have had a, a short sale business uh, running for quite some time, correct? That's it too. That's it. Yep. You got them all. So what, what <laughs> made, yeah. So is, am, I, am I missing another one? Oh yeah. Multifamily too. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what, what made you want to get involved with real estate investing, man? 
Oh, well, it, the, the quick story is I was an investment banker here in the Boston area. Um, it sounds way more sexy than it was. I was more on the custody level. And <laughs> they had me working 70, 80 hours a week. Uh, you know, I love the people I worked with, which kind of kept me there, but they had me working holidays and, you know, foreign trading and all that stuff. And it was just, it was a bear. And I remember it was actually a board game I was playing with a couple of buddies of mine. It was a, the game of risk, which a lot of yeah. us entrepreneurs know. Love <laughs> risk, man. Love it. Yes. And they, you know, the people who are good at risk, and it's unfortunate because everybody kind of gangs up on you, gets you out first, right? So um, as a joke, I turned on some late night TV. That was 2.30 in the morning. And uh, there was an infomercial for, you know, $49 uh, to learn how to buy real estate pennies on the dollar. Who was, was it? Who was it? Was it, was it John called? Bex. John Bex tax John lien free system. John Bex, yep. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't know anything about real estate at the time, but as a joke, I picked up the phone, had my buddies watch me. I'm like, guys, look, you, you're forcing me to now order in, late night infomercials. I don't know what you're doing. So um, I bought this binder and I, it came in the mail. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Like I started reading it and didn't know what tax liens were, didn't know what, how real estate investing was. And it said, hey, if you're serious about real estate investing, when I got to the end of it, call this 800 number. I guess I'm serious. So I'll call that number. I'll call that number. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the best salesperson in the world. Got me to take out three credit cards for my first like $6,500 boot camp, you know, over the phone weekly sessions. And I did that for maybe eight weeks, learned all, you know, kind of the basics. And I honestly didn't get that much out of that mentorship. But what I did get out of it is they made me read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, right? Yeah, uh, Keith book. book. Yeah. And that's what changed everything. I, as a banker, as a former, you know, it just changed my whole mindset, changed my world. And I knew that businesses and real estate is where I wanted to head for sure. Yeah. That's so awesome. I, I, man. So, whole, the long version, which we don't have to get into today because you've already heard that, but <laughs> no, I, I want to hear something more of that. So you're one. So did you have an influence at all for investing besides John Beck? Did you have anybody else that, you know, that's more of the I was more your teacher and educator at that point, but did you have anybody else that was like influencing you for investing? Yeah. You, you know what? Um, my best influence, I'm going to say Kiyosaki, but I'm sure a lot of people, your, a lot of your you know, former interviews have said the same. Um, Robert Kiyosaki, as far as changing the mindset around. And honestly, I, you know, similar to your story, Corey, I, I had a really tough start in real estate where I, my first five deals, I kind of left, lost everything. And I started way in the hole. The, the next person I was going to quit everything at that point. Um, we don't have to get into that story unless it's, I, I know we don't have time today to get into that story. It's on bigger pockets. Who wants to read it? Um, but Marshall Silver was actually the guy. Uh, he was another guy. He came into town for the learning annex, sold, you know, a, a three day weekend called the turning point. And I, I went there and honest to God, the guy, you know, he's a, he's a entertainment hypnotist out of Vegas. You might've heard of him, uh, oh, but yeah. he's, he changed my world, man. He, he made me, you know, take ownership, accept that everything that happened was because I let it happen and I made decisions and wasn't informed enough. And once you take ownership and you have that master program, you can kind of spin off anything. You just, okay, what do I learn from this? What do I learn from this? Where's my next failure? When can I, you know, what do I take from this and succeed? Absolutely. And he's probably been the biggest influence for sure. Wow. That is crazy. Yeah. I do know Marshall pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well. We talk on uh, Facebook several times and I actually have a great story. One of these times, uh, you and I will, uh, maybe uh, when we see each other again, we're in the same mastermind uh, group together, collective genius. And yeah. I'm excited that you're a part of uh, CG man. And, uh, so we'll have a conversation about uh, Marshall with, uh, no boo. You have to remind me no boo <laughs> and Marshall silver. So, uh, yeah, all right. great, great story. But yeah, hypnotist been on, you know, at back in the day, I think it was Jay Leno and maybe even Carson. I don't know if he's, you know, been around for a while. Yeah. Um, Great. He's great very hypnotist. old and he has less hair than I do. So that's great. Good. Great hypnotist. And uh, obviously someone that continues to have a lot of uh, influence and success. Um, and Erica, his wife too. I remember anyway, we'll, we'll just have to tell a story. Uh, one of these times whenever uh, we meet, when we see each other again, Nick, but what <laughs> did you have a breaking point? Because a lot of people, they do have a breaking point before they kind of move into being an entrepreneur or being into this place of where it's like, I want to quit working for somebody else, which is the whole premise of the Rich Dad Poor Dad book. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, taught me a whole bunch, probably one of the a, a pivotal book in my life as well, uh, on learning how to basically uh, have uh, you work in the place of, of having businesses and and like the cash flow quadrant, right? Not not being an employee, right? Not having a self being self employed, 
but really being in, in the business quadrant of really creating a business and the business starts to basically serve you instead of you serving um, the business or you serving someone else that's building their life and dreams of the business. Um, and so you're not, you're not fulfilling your aspirations and dreams and goals that God's given in you. What did you have a breaking point for, uh, that kind of pushed you over to being an entrepreneur? Yeah, I did. Um, so besides obviously the working at the bank, while I loved everybody I worked with was, was kind of a grind, right. And, uh, they, with the overworking and, and now I knew after reading those books that real estate and businesses were my way out. I remember the actual day, um, I was, I had finally gotten back into real estate after my first terrible five deals that went terribly wrong. And I was doing a deal in uh, Somerville, Mass, which is kind of a condo conversion market here, a little bit just north of Boston. And I had my first, um, my first, uh, I guess you'd say contractor helping me out. And I also had a money, a private investor on that deal. Now it was a, you know, family, family member. So, uh, you know, they knew that I kind of almost knew what I was doing, but not quite. <laughs> so I remember those, the contractors themselves trying to manage this project while working that 60, 70 hour week job. And I remember oh. the, the only contractors that I could find that were actually not trying to screw me were the ones that if I didn't respond to their text or call, you know, that day they, I would get voicemails like, I don't do business this way. I need people to show up and answer my call, con you know, my calls when I'm calling. And you're like, I'm a investment banker the, most of the day, right? Like I'm doing this on the, on the side, but you don't obviously say that, right? Yeah. Right. I was kind of keeping that to myself for that. At that point, I had made the decision. I was a real estate investor, not, not a banker. And I was doing the bank on the side job. That was like kind of a, that was my new oh, I mindset. Got right? I got you right. Yeah. But I, I remember I was just getting screwed left and right by these contractors. And of course, you know, my, my family member, the investor, uh, they also were having some trouble because of the delays. And that was really where I said, you know what, if I'm going to, I either got to, you know, S H I T or get off the pot at this point. And, you know what? Uh, Let, let's try This is a good segue to, because I normally ask you about what's like working for you, but I want to dig more into the pain if you're okay, because I think that people actually learn a lot more from the pain than they do a lot more to, from their successes. Cause I know you're having a lot of success now, Nick, but can you talk about what some of your biggest challenges were in real estate? You said those five deals. Can you kind of talk about some of the pain that you went through and the big challenges there? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, the biggest, uh, the biggest pain was, was the starting out. So when starting out, I knew real estate was my way out. And, um, the, my first, I was mad at myself cause I, that let's fast forward and, um, call it, I'm still at the bank, but I had started investing in a whole bunch of courses and I was mad at myself cause I hadn't taken any action yet. Right. So you bought and, a bunch of courses they were sitting on the shelf. That's yeah, exactly. Exactly. There, I was sort of paging through them, but I wasn't really getting into them. Yeah. You weren't really taking the time. Then you bought, you get another one, you get excited by another one. Yeah. That's it. The bright shiny object syndrome, right? That's it. <laughs> yes. But I remember I needed an accountability partner and I didn't really have one. So I remember, uh, actually it was back, back in the day. I know you don't believe me, but I did have way more hair back then. I could even flip it like this. <laughs> and in my, I think you're uh, sexy looking, man, I don't know. what I, I think it's bald. I, I love it. I, I think it looks, it looks great, man. Own that. Yeah. Appreciate that. Well, let me, I'm going to give you another uh, image then, right? Imagine me in the shower naked. That's, you. that's, that's for all your audiences. Okay, I want to take back what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I say that because Cross honestly, I remember Cross that line. was literally where I knew I needed an accountability partner. And I didn't have one. So I literally just was looking around one day. I was in the shower and I happened to see my shampoo bottle on the, on the side. Like, you know something? I'm, I am going to have a deal done before that shampoo bottle runs out. Like that was, that Are was my serious. That was really your moment. You're not kidding. That was, well, that was, yeah, that was like the thing that's good. All right. Every single day goes down a little bit more. Like I got to do a deal. I got to do something with, so with you, these had, you had, you basically used a shampoo bottle as your accountability <laughs> at that day. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really have a coach or mentor and all that. So I should have, I mean, looking back, was that smart? I probably should have just grabbed a coach or mentor at that point and went no, for I it. No, I love it because you, you anchored something, um, as a, as a, as a constant. Right. You know, that thing was when you come back, it was going to be it, it was basically a challenge. You challenged yourself. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. it. And I remember there's a day came when it was kind of a, a towards the end, towards the bottom of it. And it was kind of out of nowhere where uh, there was this gentleman from out uh, Minnesota actually had contacted me and, and sort of said, hey, listen, you know, I, I see you're you know, active in the in the social forums and I'm finding these undervalued pieces of real estate out here. And, you know, we're going to buy these, we're going to put in tenant lease option buyers into them. They're going to pay 20% above market rent 
for these things. And they're going to sign a purchase and sale agreement to cash out 20% above what we pay for them in three years. And I didn't know what tenant buyers were. I didn't know what lease options were. And I certainly didn't know uh, market cycles and being, mind you, this was 2005, right? Yeah, right, um, right, right at the start of the recession. Really, right, <laughs> right at the start. So uh, I, and you know, back then too, the biggest part about these deals is they could legally get money back at the purchase closing because they had something called a payment authorization. Totally sketchy and illegal now, but you buy a house for $400,000, seller turns around, gives you a check at closing 75,000 saying, thank you so much. Not, and not on the HUD or on the HUD? That was on the HUD. Yep, wow. it was all legit. It was all legit. And of course it was 90% or hundred percent leveraged with, with financing. So I'm like, well, screw this. I'm not doing one of these. You, how many you got? All right, I'm doing five. I'm going to do five in one. Week. Five and, uh, deals. Yeah. Yep, that sight unseen. I saw pictures and all that stuff. And um, oh, what happened was, uh, you know, we, so we got, it was a 60, 40 split deal and all that stuff. So we basically, I took, um, got my money from those closings. We we're super excited. Me and a colleague of mine here from the Boston market, we're doing, he bought a few of, of his own. We had a call with him on Monday morning for next steps and tenants and all that stuff. And he didn't show up to the call. And as we kept looking into it, you know, he had sort of, maybe there were no tenant buyers. Maybe he had sort of made up all these contracts, made up all these things. And oh. we were stuck now with, you know, hundred percent, 90 percent leveraged properties. And, you know, we paid a property manager to try to manage them. We paid an attorney to try to chase him for a while, then realized at the end of the day, this wasn't going to work out. And I, all five deals were lost to my own short sales. Actually, one was a foreclosure, four were short sales. Mm -hmm. And I started as a banker you know, with, with, I was in the hole now, all the judgment, I didn't know what a short sale was. So I'm literally like, I'm a, I'm a distressed homeowner. I'm, whatever you put in front of me, I'm going to sign it, right? Like just get this out of me, get, get it away from me. And my call, my phone was going off every 48 seconds. Cause it, you know, it was EMC mortgage corporation on auto call, right? Oh it was, it was terrible. And I remember signing away, not knowing what I was signing. I signed 400,000 in promissory notes and judgments or right, the right to pursues. And then I, um, I, of course, my credit was not completely shot. And if they even checked it, I was still working at the bank, thank God at the time, but if they had checked my credit, I'd lose my job. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was a tough, I basically then restarted with no credit, 400,000 in the hole and now no cash. <laughs> so tough, tough learning opportunity there. But that's, that's really where I mentioned before, I still had already paid for one of these Marshall Silver events that I hadn't ever taken. And I just, I already paid for this, might as well go for it. And that's what sort of changed it and turned it all around. But you talk about pain, that I had to, I still knew real estate was my way in, uh, way out of the corporate world rather. I still knew that the, the, the B quadrant is where I wanted to be, eventually the I. So I remember saying, if I'm, I have no cash or credit, I'm going to start wholesaling, right? And I, I met a local guy here in the Boston market. He was doing those kind of conversions in the Somerville, Cambridge market. He taught me what he looked for. He taught me his rules. He eventually loaned me his contractor because I didn't really know much about construction at the time. And, you know, that I knew I had to get my rules down as a banker. I'm like, I got, how, I can't afford to lose any more money. What do I have to do to not lose any more money? So I started, you know, how to buy right, how to, how to manage and, and negotiate effectively. And if I can't ever sway by these rules, because if I do, I'm going to get hurt. Mm. And that was, uh, filters. So you, you, you created these new filters that really were out of, this massive situation that you went through that was, I mean, borderline fraud, really. I mean, the guy that was um, dealing with you and you trusted the guy, you had a deal that looked really good, but at the end of the day, he wasn't being truthful with you. And then that costs you a whole lot, even more with attorney fees. So then whenever you took the Marshall Silver class, you probably took on a new level of understanding of all these decisions I made. No one put a gun to my head to do it. I was just excited about doing a deal. I was excited about doing, you know, making money and making this work. And so and I excited. Thought it was almost out. So I had to do it. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. And, and then maybe some desperation, which desperation is a great motivator. Right. But sometimes, like you said, uh, jumping off the cliff, building a parachute on the way down, uh, even though often entrepreneurs do that, uh, it's often not the, the best, best case scenario. Um, and so then Marshall gave you a whole new probably understanding of, uh, of perspective of taking ownership and stuff. And then you start creating some new filters and, 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 and setting up some parameters where you weren't going to get into that situation again. 
you nailed it. You nailed it. And looking back on it now, Corey, you definitely relate with me on this is, you know, without that experience, there's no way it could be where I am today. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, your pain is your power. You know, people that um, talk about uh, pain in ways that, you know, as a uh, setback and woe is me and kind of the victim mentality, it doesn't really give you any kind of uh, positive impact to be able to accept something like that, um, which is not true at all. You are a product of your decisions. And people, uh, people argue with you all day long on that. Uh, I believe you are. I know you believe you are. Um, because often we make these decisions, often emotionally, not necessarily logically. And it's because um, we get excited and we, we want to trust someone. We want to we work with someone. And you learn. Uh, every entrepreneur I know, Nick, has fell down more times than they succeeded. Every mm-hmm. single entrepreneur I know. And, and, and some of the most successful ones that I know, and not just making a lot of money, but like lifestyle and um, assets in terms of what they've, what they've accumulated, but maybe not like just making millions and millions of dollars. Some of the most successful ones I know has failed the most. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so, you know, I just, I, I think that your pain is your power. So you're a product of, of that. And I'm excited that you uh, created those parameters. So then you went to doing wholesaling and sounds like you're doing some rehabbing now. And then you, you're, you're doing some short sales. What is yeah. what we call our profit master investing strategy? What is something that has really impacted your bottom line that you can share one of your best uh, strategies for making big profits? Absolutely. Sure. Well, aside from what a lot, I know most every one of your students, you know, the CRM was obviously a, a huge accountability uh, master in that time. I would say one of our big value adds was going down that short sale route. So, you know, me and I, I met this partner, Marianne, she was a door opener at one of the local real estate investor associations here. And um, she had somewhat of a marketing background. I certainly had a short sale background by that point for, with my own and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, had um, kind of the investment sense. So, we, we partnered up back then when the market was on its way, to, if it's not already at the bottom, it was on its way down. And um, we learned the systems and we, we, we were able to provide that, I think, as the in-house service solution for most sellers here in that market. So when that became, when it came time to meet with a motivated seller or a seller that needed our help, it was, you know, hey, we, we, we have a lot of things and our tagline even to this day is even if we can't buy, we still can help. And I know a lot of people teach, you know, just make sure get that offer in and make sure they, you know, if it's a no, you leave that immediately. If it's a yes, then you take it right there. We're not really about that. We're about branding and kind of the slow presence here in the market. So one of those big ads that we could bring on is say, what, what else can we do? So maybe we can't buy this house. Maybe this is not a win-win for you, but is this a traditional listing? Do you just need a, a, a handyman to help you with certain things? Do you need a mover? Do you need the biggest one is, you have creditors calling you. Well, mm. how about if we step right in the middle of that? We have an in-house debt negotiation firm. We can help stop those calls and 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 go through that with you know take care of that process with you. That I think was one of the biggest uh, moves that we made. And to this day, obviously we do it for our own deals and projects, but we've become a major servicing arm to other real estate agents and attorneys in Mass and New Hampshire and Maine right now. So I think that's a huge value add that we brought to the table that really helped. <laughs> So, you know, help, helped with our, our, our offer, helped with our give, helped with our closings. Um, if that helps. So. That's great. Yeah. So uh, um, you and I both are uh, on the same path there. Uh, myself having a loss mitigation company, a yep. short sell software, kind of getting started in the short sell uh, market uh, back in 2007, 2008. I know uh, uh, that, that rode very, very well. And I think that you create a value add. Um, whenever you are offering something of specialized knowledge, you know, and, and that's one thing that the people need and you're doing it from a way where you're actually serving uh, what can help them instead of just what can help you. And I think that's a big, that's a big difference, man. I appreciate your, your mindset for that and, uh, and, and doing that because you're going to win, you're going to win more uh, whenever you're serving others uh, than just, just, just having the mindset of serving yourself. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah we agree. What, what's one of the greatest lessons that you've learned to help you get to where you are today, Nick? <laughs> greatest lessons we've learned. Well, besides 
besides the obvious one, which we've talked about, which is taking ownership of all your own mistakes and failures, right? I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. an obvious one for me specifically. Yeah. Um, the, I would say a big shift was made in my company when we started really starting to track better. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, similar to, I know a lot of your students actually drilling down and finding data versus turning it from a hobby into a real business, right? I think that was another big shift that we had made. So coming in from, wow, man, I just did, you know, 20 rehabs this year to, well, you know, it's not even about the number of rehabs. Let's talk about cost per lead and cost per deal and, and right. drill down to really how much, um, what's a dollar per hour, right? Like when you start really tracking those elements, it really helped me bring it from the hobby into a business sense. And, uh, Along with that came a lot of struggles with growth with people, right? So, you know, I, have, I brought on a couple uh, awesome, you know, directors right now, which I consider them partners, you know, Rob, and um, uh, we have a director of operations starting on Monday. And we have an amazing, you know, office manager, an amazing bookkeeper, uh, managing people after the tracking. That was a whole other set of lessons I never thought I'd, I'd ever learn. <laughs> right. Not real estate, right? Real estate's about people, not sticks and bricks. Well, running an office and running a team is also a whole different business than, than the real estate and, and dealing with motivated you know, sellers. So dealing with I'm, learning, I'm still learning that every single day. I don't know what I'm going to expect the next day, you know, so <laughs> dealing, dealing with personalities because you don't have control. You know, a, a, even as a manager, you want to have control over things, you know, but whenever someone gets sick, you don't have control over that. When someone has a baby, you don't have control over that. When, um, you know, someone uh, needs to go take a vacation for three weeks, you don't really have control over that. So you have to learn a whole new set of skills of managing. And you talked about going from a hobby to a business. Well, hobbies are fun. And that's why, you <laughs> to, like, just, uh, you know. That's a great know, analogy. I mean, that's really, ho hobbies are a lot of fun. Um, you know, you go fly a kite, you go race RC cars, you go go-karting, you go golfing. Hobbies are fun, right? When you run a business, uh, in the beginning, it, it really isn't what you consider fun in terms of like what a hobby is, right? It isn't like you go in and, uh, you know, you have smiles all day. You're going to have to deal with uh, being stoic, right? You're going to have to deal with um, personalities and have empathy. And that can be sometimes, depending on your personality, that isn't fun. And so yeah. at one point, I think that, uh, when you start building that team, that's when you really start to get excited about finding other people on the team that are good at certain things. Maybe somebody's really, really good at dealing with other people in the team. And so that person needs to be HR. That needs to be someone that's really good on, you know, those personalities and checking in with those things. Maybe um, you're not really good at being a, a, a manager per se. Maybe you need to have a COO that can manage those people. Maybe you're just really good at being a visionary. And maybe that's, you need to be spending more time and growing the business and marketing and, and talking with your marketing guys, marketing um, people in the business tend to be real big thinkers and optimistic and, you know, um, salespeople, salespeople are obviously, uh, you know, you want them to be uh, pretty, pretty aggressive uh, with, with not taking no for an answer, but they also have to be very empathetic. You know, a big part of sales is listening. You know, and for some salespeople, they don't know, they don't want to shut up. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's true. Right. So it's, it's a hobby is usually a one person, maybe two person type of thing. When you go to a business, now you have a whole other set of skills and everything else that you have to deal with and learn. Right. You know, and that's where my learning is happening day to day right now. You know, you, you've, you've, you've clearly got more than that than I have. So I definitely should take some leadership from you on that. <laughs> well, it, I, it, it is. It's like there is a difference between having a hobby and, and a business. So you hit it, hit it on the head. What's one of your favorite motivational uh, or business quotes, Nick? Favorite? Well, um, don't let perfect get in the way of better. Ooh, I like uh, my, bro my broker told me that. Uh, my real estate broker told me that when I was a, a, the brief stint that I was an agent in a retail firm before I became a broker and had our own investment firm. <laughs> I like that, man. That's great. I love yeah, that. Yeah. His name was Andy Wilson. And I remember he was just talking about, you know, I think it was a e, an e newsletter that he was sending out, uh, you know, to, for something. And I remember thinking of that, obviously that 
he didn't have any idea that was going to have such a profound impact over everything I did going forward. But, you know, we want to make sure every time we put out a piece, right, that it's as good as possible. But you can still get stuck on, oh, is that the right color? Oh, we're doing a new logo. So is that the right color? Is that the right wording? Is that the right size? Maybe we should wait another week and test it, you know, trial test it. Everything we do now is it, we go through that test. Like, all right, is it needed? Yes. How, what is it? What is the critical element here that we need to push it to before we just release it? Okay. We'll make it better next week. <laughs> right. So, right. That's great. Okay. So, so is Andy Wilson, the guy that actually said that? His name is Andy Wilson. He's just a local broker here. He's a, he's now uh, retired. He's still a sales agent here. Uh, but he was an incredible guy. He took over a brokerage because his dad had passed wow. and he didn't really, you know, he was new to management as well. He was an agent, right? He was a sales guy and he wow. had to literally learn management overnight. And um, he became an awesome manager. Uh, and I learned a lot from him in my three years there. It was at Century 21 in Chelmsford, which is no longer, but it's uh, anyway, he was, he was a great guy, a uh, very inspirational guy too. I'm I'm going to I'm going to share that. I love that. So don't let perfect get in the way yeah. of better. You you got it. Yep. Don't let perfect get in the way of better. Man, that's great. That is rich, man. I love that. <laughs> he might have taken it from somebody online at some point, but I don't know. I'll I'll yeah. give him credit. <laughs> yeah, we'll give him credit. Well, I want to give you credit for it. So uh, yeah. I I want to I want to share I'll give you credit for. It. What books do you recommend? And I know you named one Rich Dad Poor Dad um that yeah. really has changed the way you think and changed your life. Absolutely. Well, you, the second one, you, which you already referenced, was cash flow quadrant, right? The uh, moving, yeah. moving from quadrant to quadrant as an employee to a self-employed to a business owner to an investor. I mean, that, yeah, the that Robert ch- Kiyosaki book, right? Exactly, Robert Kiyosaki book. Um, I I was trying to come up with a or find one of my motivational books upstairs, but I'll tell you, the one on the business side, which I'm, I know you've read and a bunch of your students have too, is Traction, oh, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, that was. And you know what the funny part is? I had not even heard of that book until about 12 months ago, uh, having been in the business now for, you know, 14 years. And uh, wow. I mean, talk about something that I was missing the boat on. So (laughs) it's huge. It it basically is a blueprint for running a small business. You have level 10 meetings, you have ways of, of, of accountability. You basically set up a way you can track progress and, You know, it's so easy not to do that. Um, so if you don't have KPIs, you don't have uh, the big rocks, the little rocks, the things that you're trying to accomplish and have them prioritize of those things, then it's real easy to work on things just to be busy, but not actually being productive. And so traction is amazing for, um, you know, uh, running those meetings in a, in a, in a professional uh, and in a way that you can see what happened last week and, correct and correct course and, and, and change where you're going this week. Uh, and also keeping the big thing, the one thing that needs to move the needle the most, uh, you know, which usually is every week in your business. Yeah. 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 He nailed it. That's, That's cool. Great, those yeah, those probably book. two best business books. Yeah. I'm going to put that uh, down in the show notes as well. Do you uh, have um, any mobile apps that uh, use on a daily basis? Are you more in uh, the tech side of things? Nick. Well, I've got a few actually. I'll go pretty quick. One of them is one that you just recommended on Facebook, which we I've now gotten my team. We're starting to use it, which is that ClickUp app. Oh yes! Uh, oh yeah. my gosh, ClickUp is incredible, <laughs> isn't it? It just came out, right? It, yeah, it, did. It, it it basically has like teamwork and um and uh, Asana and to do this like in one app right that was, so, it was an yeah. awesome you made that you kind of just threw it out there as a general comment i'm like i'll check this thing out i'm like oh my god it combines everything that we're using and I it's free yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's a <laughs> it's yeah it's a pretty a pretty incredible so cool that's awesome and so you just started using that then we just started and yeah we're slowly getting i mean you know we're, we've moved all of our to-dos from our you know our level 10 meetings we're, we're trying to move them all over into that app so we can start tracking a lot better and um that's pretty we're still learning i mean that's a yeah. you know tremendous amount of uh learning on that one yeah we also a couple other ones that i use which are definitely worth noting um what a five minute journal uh you might have heard of that one that was yeah. kind of recommended by tim ferris so i kind of looked into that one which is literally a you know way to start your day the yeah. three things you're grateful for three things you want to get accomplished that day yep. and at the end of the day you look back and say you know did i accomplish what i set out to do and uh great little app you know, and it keeps me on par and it also pings me to remind me to do it if I decide one day I'm going to procrastinate. <laughs> yep. 
Yep. So, and then the last one, uh, which I just found too, uh, and maybe I'm the last one to find this. It's called Texpand, T-E-X-P-A-N-D. It's basically, I'm finding, if I'm on Facebook Messenger or G- Gmail or um, texting other people, if I'm texting people the same thing over and over again, and for me, a lot of it was like email addresses or, um, uh, you know, uh, my address, like a business address, anything like that, or even a canned response, you can literally program uh, with a few different letters on your keyboard and it will fill it in for, it. it it's a way to, Fix your autocorrect in a way more professional way where you can dictate what you want to say. Like with okay. two, I have this app, but I think it's you're called Text Expander. Tech, you have you have an iPhone probably, right? Yes. So uh, it's tech, on, a, on a Galaxy Samsung, it's Textpand. Yeah, okay. same thing. Text no. Expander, right? Yeah. So it's a great so because you're like you said, you're typing emails in, and then you hit the tab, the tab button, and it automatically will. Sometimes it'll can dictate uh, your your phrasing, your words, and yeah, it saves a ton. Uh, you put shortcuts and shortcuts in there, man. That's great. I use that too, but it's called text <laughs> expander. So I, yeah. On um, don't I, take that. That's going to be one of my gives at CG unless it's okay. already been done. I, I won't <laughs> take it. Yeah, it's good. Did you do the paid version? Not yet. No, just okay. I literally just got this like two weeks ago, but it's already saved me at least ten minutes, you know, a week, so, <laughs> which will add up to more and more as I use it way more. So <laughs> yeah, it's a super super inexpensive uh, paid version uh, as well. But it's a great. That is a great app. I totally love that app too. Cool, man. Nice. You're using some great tools. <laughs> one of them, like, thanks to you, the big yeah, to-do yeah. one. There's, it. there's another one that um, <clears throat> that you might check out that I, I know you've heard of, um, but let's see here. Um, let me see. Actually, you know what? I have it on my computer. Let me just check. Do you have Grammarly? No. So... You have to check out Grammarly. Um, it is a awesome tool for writing, um, but it also gives you t- t- it gives you uh, when you make misspelling errors, which is often for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can just click on the word, and it automatically gives you two or three different choices, and it just so fast. So you can just click a button, and it changes the word, changes the word, changes the word. And it's oh cool. It is a cool so it's grammar.lee. Grammar dot yeah. lee. And Google. it's different, it's different than the autocorrect, right? Because the autocorrect yes. okay. Yes, it is different than the autocorrect. Um, and it, you can also create um, like if you're writing emails and things like that, it gives you its own kind of text editor, if you will, and you can save those inside of Grammarly. And oh, cool. um, and then once you've you've read you've written the whole te- email or written the whole paragraph or whatever it will give you suggestions on better writing, better words to use. Oh, cool. That's really neat. Yeah. It's almost like, it's almost like a, like a, like a word auditor, right? Like a proofreader. Essentially it is your, uh, uh, an AI proofreader, essentially. That's cool. That's very neat. Yeah. Check that out. Especially the kind of writing that we do. You, you, right. you do especially. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's awesome, man. Do you get eight hours of sleep at night? No. Uh, and I'm, I'm don't, so I find that I need them. Uh, I, at one point I was, I was striving for to getting more sleep, getting more sleep, getting more sleep. And then I like, why, why try to force this? So I get my Fitbit tells me I make five hours and 12 minutes average every night. And I'm very happy that way. But if I get four and a half, it's a terrible, terrible night. <laughs> <laughs> Cause you don't have that REM sleep, right? You, gotta, you get woke yeah. up during that pattern. Yeah, but that's my cycle. Five hours and 12 minutes. I don't know. I feel great. When five I wake up. hours and 12 minutes. Pretty specific. Nick, <laughs> that's that's what I checked it this morning on Fitbit. That's why. But I have, I've got you know young kids, so you know we get up and uh, get them, get them ready and all that stuff every morning. So usually well, go to bed around eleven thirty ish. Okay. What What is your morning routine? Morning routine. I love these questions. Yeah. Uh, morning routine is obviously we, five minute journal is kind of one of the first things that I do. But I, I do get up. I you know help my kids uh, kind of get up, get up and ready. Um, get them out to uh, you know, get them out to the vehicle outside that's waiting for them usually. And that they, uh, they take off. Then I come back in, I do my five minute journal at that point. Um, I will, uh, check, I'll do a quick check on, uh, I don't check email ever, but I'll do a check quick check on like a bigger pockets to, you know, if I get some writing done that early in the morning and then I'll go down, I've got a, a gym downstairs in my basement here. So I'll, I'll kind of go down there and do my thing down there for 30 to 45 minutes. I, I'm still a big fan of the at home, uh, insanity workouts and P90X. Oh, nice. And, all that stuff. So that, uh, I, that helps me down there and take 45 minutes down there, come up here. Um, if I'm not doing one of my fasts, I do a lot of that intermittent fasting. Um, 
and if, if I'm, if I'm not doing a fast, I'll you know make myself some eggs or chicken or something that, that high protein breakfast. Usually if I'm on a fast, I'll just have some water and, uh, and, you know, some, maybe, some, you know, a shot of ketones if I wanted to do something like that. But, you know, I'm all into that stuff now. And um, I, at that point, uh, you know, take a shower and get ready for the day. Um, that's so when you wake up to whenever you take a shower, what, give me that timeline. Sure. Uh, wake up at about uh, 545. Okay. And 545, um, get the kids up and out. And I work out at around seven-ish or so. And then from seven o'clock, I'm back up and um, between seven and seven thirty, I do the workout and then I'm back up eight 15 ish or so to shower and get ready for the day at that point. So I'm usually by nine o'clock. I'm, I'm good to go. Usually you're good to go. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's, that's pretty interesting. So, so the kids are gone by seven. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's a solid two hours there, but I, and I, I'm kind of lived by the do not check your email until you're ready to get sucked in. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> Yeah, and that's true. That is really true. When you're ready to get sucked in, because it will, it will suck in. You're always, you're always responding to other people's urgencies. That's it. Right? Yeah. 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 So the creative part or the, or the building or the growth, if, if that's also when I'm building out priorities too. If I need to build out more priorities for the day, or if I have a creative or content project, I want to try to get that done before 9:30 or 10 AM. Um, that's usually what I try to do. And, and, and I can't thank enough since I'm on a public forum here. I mean, you know, Rob, uh, director of sales and acquisitions. I mean, he's now uh, the guy with the sales team that is responding to uh, incoming leads. I mean, that would be, uh, that was a very difficult to try to grow the business when <laughs> you're, you're have to be on waiting for the text, waiting for the email to come in. And it was, uh, yeah. uh, yes, you're, you're awesome. Yeah. Giving, giving away some of the responsibility um, is, is a huge part of growing to be a business owner from hobby to a business, right? Um, yeah. That is a huge piece of it uh, because you essentially, you know, are trusting somebody with you. You feel like you're trusting them with your life. You know, I'm, I'm trusting you with my life. If, if you don't, if you screw this up, you could screw up my life, right? Yeah, that's um, a good point. Well, yeah. Now I'm even more nervous. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, right. Uh, but all of that is, is those stories that we tell ourselves. We tell ourselves that story over and over again, that this is so crucial. This is so this. The reality is, is that very few things are that crucial. We make them more dramatic and crucial than what they are. In fact, we hold ourselves back often from what we tell ourselves. And what often what we tell ourselves is not the truth, right? The truth is really something different than what we tell ourselves. Because when we, when we look at ourselves, we're critical. And then that critical part makes an urgency and the urgency part makes stress and stress creates a more, I mean, so it creates that more of a whirlwind of emotions and things like that. And so by the time we're, we're letting something go, it's just like so begrudgingly, right? Compared yeah. to say, here you go. I <laughs> you nailed I, it. I, I trust you. You know, Hey, what, what should I do? What do you think you should do? Oh, I think I should do this and this. That's probably what I would do. <laughs> right like that, it, man. it's 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 tough though that's a tough transition so i'm right uh, i'm totally right there right there with you what are you most grateful for most grateful i mean uh kids are always the kids right so I mean, number one almost every single day i'm learning new things every single morning every evening with these kids um you know i, we, I started a little later in life we got a two and a four year old and man they um I didn't, I thought I knew what I knew and I learned that I, I knew nothing. So. <laughs> I knew nothing. <laughs> I knew nothing with these guys. So they, they are the light of my world right now. Um, and uh, they're, they're pretty much what I'm grateful for every single day. And then beyond that, it's, I'm finding that, you know, my, my uh, gratitude is very similar to you and everybody, you know, too. I mean, definitely not for things anymore, the people around me, right? If my job is nothing else right now to surround myself with just incredible, grateful, amazing people that inspire me day to day. Um, so especially those people that I consider my partners, right? You know, Rob, Lori, um, you know, Marianne, uh, a whole bunch of all my agents, short sales staff. I mean, those people around me at this point, uh, that, who are working their butts off every day, just like we all do. You get up, same, do the same thing that we do every day, right? Um, I'm very, very thankful for those teams. And I try to pick a, a, a different person every single day to at least reflect on for myself. What I should be better at is when I reflect on it myself in my journal is to actually reach out to the person and, and 
you know, make something, Hey, listen, I was thinking about you today. I got to get better at that. And I'm not, you know, there's a lot of things I could get better at. But that's a good one. I think work in progress, man. That's great. That's great. Especially with the kids, the kids teach you a whole, a whole lot. What, at what point you don't, you didn't really talk about it too much, but at what point would you recommend hiring a coach or a mentor? How important has one been to you in your life? A hundred percent. So, uh, I should have done it a lot earlier. So when I told you I was looking to a shampoo bottle as an accountability coach, that was probably not the ideal way to do it. <laughs> I love that story though, man. I'll never forget the shampoo accountability story. I love it. <laughs> I actually still have the shampoo bottle. So I bring it around here sometimes when I speak at events and stuff and I wrote on it like the shut up and do it, you know, 2005, all that. <laughs> That's but, um, awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. That's where the whole tagline shut up and do it came from. It's for like up here, right? So um, I would... Uh, I would say a coach and a mentor is good once you have the, everyone, if they want to, they should get basic knowledge, right? I think that listening to these types of podcasts, aligning themselves with people locally in their market, going to biggerpockets.com, all these things are really good for people to a point. So they get the basic knowledge down or they get, Hey, listen, real estate's kind of what I want to do. All right. Oh, wow. There's like 15 strategies. What do I want to focus on? And I think once they find out what they want to focus on at that point, and they're willing to kind of put themselves out there and commit a little bit, they should absolutely get a coach at that point to push them to that next level, to hold them accountable, show them the process to cut years and years of time off of their learning curves. Amen. Yeah, and uh, man, the, any money that they pay for that mentorship or coaching, I mean, people, you know this, I mean, I, I used to complain about it too. Like, Oh my God, 6,000 for boot camp. Wow. 30,000, 40,000 for a mentorship. Gee, you know, and looking back at it, did I, were all of them worth every penny I put into it? Maybe not. You know, did I give it my all on some of them? Probably not that either, right? But right. the ones that you commit to and the dollars that you put in, you get that back at least 10x back. You know what I mean? And the amount of time it saves you and the pain that it saves you and the losses that you won't have because you had someone leading you through that process, I a thousand percent am, am in favor, right? Yeah, and, coaching coaching is almost like the compound effect, you know, for just for, for our productivity. Right. Yeah. Um, and mentorship, you know, and, and um, it, it's it's one of those things where if you follow who you're working with and you put take action on what is being coached from someone that has been there, done there, been there and done that and has gotten the result that you want. Right. Uh, and I'll even throw out there that you have spoke to their previous students, mm. basically just like a. Uh, checking a referral for, you know, someone's going to hire for a job. Like you would look at their referrals yep. uh, listen, and call for referrals. And you found someone that is, uh, that you, you feel like you're going to learn from and they have a good track record of success. Then don't try to recreate the wheel, be coachable. You know, one of the biggest challenges for students, I mean, obviously as a coach and uh, I, I deal with students and, we turn down students when we're on a strategy session with them. If I can sense that they're not going to be coachable yeah. and, and, and don't get me wrong. Uh, you have this type a personality where you're all these drivers and I can do it better. I'm going, don't tell me I can't do it. I, I'll show you that all has a purpose, right? But whenever you're working with a coach, you got to throw that out the window. Yeah. Please yeah. throw all of that out the window. Everything that you have learned up to that point, when you get to a coach, you got to just put it on the shelf. You can go back and pick it up if that serves you, whatever, but just be coachable. And I understand please, please. once you learn to open yourself up to new ways of thinking, I'll give you an, I mean, I've said this many times, but one, one way that really changed my, my mindset when I spent time with Evan Pagan was whenever I let go of control, I get more of it. Yeah. Whenever I let go of control, I get more of it. That's a whole, that's a, that's a brain explosion. It's a great right. quote too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, but it's, it's one of those things where I, I didn't think that like he had, he had to, he had to express that. He had to say that in order for me to have a reframe of what control really was. Hmm. Right. What if control was really controlling you instead of you controlling the thing? What if your belief and you controlling everything in your life, every piece of it, all your people, you can do it better than anyone else. You're not going to give up responsibility. One man show I've, I've delegated before. It doesn't work. What if all these ideas of control was really controlling you from succeeding? So these, these ways of thinking 
Like those are different models. Those are different complete models that if you're not coachable, you're not willing to, you're not going to be able to receive it because you're going to go in thinking, I know better than you. I've done these deals. I'm smarter than you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I can work harder than you. You don't know me. You know, you, all this other stuff. You got to drop the ego. It's going to yeah. come in with the open heart and just, you know, and an open soul and an open mind and saying, man, I've invested in you. I'm invested in this program. I'm willing to learn. Now let's, now let's, now let's learn. Right. So I think that it, it is a, a big value to someone if they're willing to be coachable. So if you summarize it, Mick, what is it? Why, why do you do what you do? Right. What, what, when you put your feet down on the floor in the morning to get mm -hmm. going, why do you do it? What's your big why in life? <laughs> My why has changed. Uh, well, uh, you probably hear that a lot too. The, I have a, I have a few, the first why that I had, I am obsessed, uh, still am, don't get to do it as much, obsessed with travel and foreign foods and foreign, call it alcoholic beverages, okay? <laughs> <laughs> obsessed with experiences. like- Experiences, let's just call that experiences. <laughs> experiences, travel, that's travel right. Experiences, right. Anywhere I can go in the world and, and enjoy uh, an amazing type, you know, uh, anything that's that, good. I love that stuff. And then, and then the too, second, part, second part would be the, um, uh, now it's, then it's the kids and then now it's literally building my team. Uh, you know, my team is now, I didn't realize that that would be a passion of mine, but literally the the development aspect of being able to kind of turn someone's mind around, my whys have definitely changed. So my kids, the team, and of course we're all doing this to try to make a living. And if with that living comes radical experiences everywhere in the world, uh, and I can bring my kids along, that's even better. You know, that's awesome, man. <laughs> that's so good. I love that too, man. <laughs> hey, if there's a way that we can serve you, what's the best way to do it? How can we get in touch with you? I know you have a podcast. Uh, I know you've got you know a, a successful real estate business. What's what's way to get in touch with you, and how can my audience serve you? Oh, that's awesome. No, hey, listen, they can all check us out at uh, aarealestategroup.com. That's double a realestategroup.com is the website. Um, you can check us out on Facebook. Um, I'm on there. My my Nick Allerud and also AA Real Estate Group. And, um, you know, we, we have the short sale mitigation on there too, but definitely, you know, thanks for the plug on the podcasts. Um, we have the shut up and do it podcasts that broadcast here from the Boston area where we have, um, motivational stories and people who've had struggles in their current real estate businesses. So if they want, they can check that out on our YouTube channel and uh, YouTube channel is AA real estate props. Uh, wow. that's our handle, I guess you'd say. We'll put all these links in the show note. Uh, sure. I appreciate you having me on the podcast. I think we had two episodes. So you, you, you're right, we, did. We, have part, we have part one and part two because I wouldn't shut up. No, it was great. Our our editor already said, submitted. He's like, this guy is amazing. I can't wait to air this. It's great. <laughs> oh, gosh. We went into some stuff there. I love well, that. I'm, I'm grateful to for you and to have met you too. I told you before, I'll say it to kind of end, end the podcast out like, you know, meeting you as, as I was already kind of in a, in a, in a good space, you put me into uh, the next channel with, with what you've gone through your challenges and where you are today. Thank you for, for kind of opening people's eyes. to where, where you're doing. Awesome. I appreciate you saying that, Nick. It means a lot. Your encouragement means a lot. Your prayers mean a lot. I'm going into um, a, uh, a testing for my, uh, for my, for my, I have an annual, uh, thyroid thyroid globulin tumor marker and a tsh tsh test uh every year and so that comes on friday and i appreciate i put a post on facebook to to have some prayers i appreciate you praying uh for that uh and coming up and man i, I love your story i love uh some of the quotes that you put on here i'm going to share i love the one uh that you put for uh, don't let perfect get in the way of better nice Really great, nice. man. So uh, I'll put that for Andy Wilson and Nick Allerud. See, I said it correctly. <laughs> sure. You got it. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I appreciate you, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you again, Nick, um, for, for being on here, and thank you for attending another Real Estate Investing Profit Masters podcast. We're going to bring some amazing guests like Nick on, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Corey. Cheers. Thanks. Bye now. Hi, this is Corey Boatwright, and I have a quick question for you. What is the fastest way to reach your goals? Is it to work harder, work smarter? 
use system and processes or hire rock star employees? What about just making more money? You know, actually, it's none of that. Those things are a byproduct of the one success component that every real estate investor or business owner that I know all have in common. And the answer is clarity. Complete laser focus on what you want, why you want it, and what are you willing to do to get it. So where do you find clarity? By hiring a coach and mentor. Now, could you reach the level of success that you want to achieve by doing this all on your own? You know, the Lone Ranger. Well, maybe, but do you think it would take you double or even triple the time to achieve it compared to hiring a coach and mentor to help guide your path, provide proven instruction with a tailored blueprint that you could follow for building a real estate business that supports your lifestyle and helps you reach your financial and personal goals? Absolutely. Here's the fact. Time isn't recyclable. So I would like to ask you to make good use of it and extend a personal invitation for you to book a phone coaching strategy session by going to callwithcory.com. That's callwithcory, Corey spelled C-O-R-Y, dot com. I'm going to ask you a few quick questions on that page, and we're going to go over and see how we can make sure that your business is on path to reach the goals that you want this year. So go to callwithcory.com, that's C-O-R-Y, and book your phone coaching strategy session today. Remember, be a servant, and I'll see you on there. You've been listening to another Real Estate Investing Profits Master Podcast Series. To receive your free real estate book, Down and Dirty, Ultimate Real Estate Investing Quick Start Guide, How to Quit Your Job to Start Flipping Houses in 90 Days or Less, head online and go to realestateinvestingprofits.com. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash realestateinvestingprofits. Thanks again for listening and stay tuned for our next episode.